Hey guys, Weeby News here. So today I'm going to be giving my character analysis for Junko Inoshima. And just a quick warning, this video will contain an immense amount of spoilers for Danganronpa Zero, so if you haven't read it yet already and don't want to be spoiled, I'd highly recommend you stop the video. And if you haven't read it yet and you would like to and you just don't know where to find translations, I'll be posting translation links in the descriptions, and these are exact translations, so it'll be just like you're reading the book and not just summaries of it. But for those of you who have already read it or do not mind being spoiled, let's go ahead and begin. For this video, I decided to split up the history portion and the analysis portion, much like I did with my Monica analysis. So starting with the history portion, Jinko states that she was despairingly hopeless from the moment she came into the world and was already tired of everything. And I do want to mention that Kadaka never wanted to include any sort of tragic backstory for Junko. In an interview, he stated that he felt more recently bad guys in games are given harsh backgrounds as some kind of explanation for their evilness, but it feels like cheating to him, and that the most dangerous thing about Junko is that she doesn't have any reason to do the things she does. So he incorporated that into her character all the way through the games as thoroughly as possible. This sort of makes my analysis a bit tougher since there is no given backstory or tragic event that happened in Junko's life that sparked some sort of evil flare inside of her. It seems to be implied in the game and by Kadaka himself that Junko was just sort of born loving despair. And although there is no tragic backstory, I do believe that there are some ways you can speculate as to why Junko ended up the way she did. One of the earliest references to Junko and Makuro's past is in Danganronpa IF and in Makuro's free time events in Danganronpa 1. And this is when Makuro refers to the fact that she and Junko were homeless for a period of time. I haven't seen a whole lot of speculation about this, but one of you guys pointed out in my Makuro analysis that it's contradictory that they would be homeless for a period of time when it was also revealed that Makuro ran away from home when her and her family were on vacation in Europe. And that was my initial reaction too when I was creating that analysis. So I did sort of come up with a theory of my own as to how this could not be contradictory, and that would be that Makuro and Jinko both grew up in this sort of cliched rich family background where the parents of the children are just too busy dealing with work to take care of them so they end up hiring babysitters and other people to take care of them and then the children feel neglected in the long run. I feel like this explanation would make sense because since we know that Jinko came to love despair at a very young age, she could have convinced Makuro to run away from home and become homeless for a period of time by manipulating her into thinking that their parents were awful people. So my idea would be after they ran away, their parents hired people to find them and bring them back home, and of course, they would eventually be rescued and do regular privileged family things like take vacations to Europe. Another thing that I think may support this would be Junko's modeling career because generally people who do pursue this type of career come from a family of wealth or a family that has some sort of success in that particular business, that way they can get their child's foot in the door or financially support them while they get started. Things like headshots that you have to start out when you're modeling can be pretty expensive, so it would make sense that they would have a wealthy background and be able to help pay for these sorts of things. Of course, none of this is confirmed. It's just sort of an idea I had to make sense of these two background elements that don't necessarily go that well together. But moving on, we do see that during her childhood, she had two very important people in her life. These being Makuro Ikasaba and Yasuke Matsuda. Makuro is of course her twin sister, but Matsuda was a childhood friend of hers and eventually became her romantic partner after a while too. It's mentioned in Danganronpa Zero that Matsuda's mother was diagnosed with some sort of unnamed disease that caused her to lose her memories. Eventually, his mother died from this disease and it was revealed that Junko comforted him during this time, telling him that she would become the person most important to him. This led him to develop strong feelings towards her, and the relationship between them was definitely mutual since Junko revealed that he was the most important person to her as well. Another defining instance about Jinko's childhood is told by Matsuda to Ryoko in the neurology lab in Danganronpa Zero. This was when he and Junko were at the beach together and Junko attempted to recreate the Sagrada Familia out of sand. He said that she worked a full month trying to build it, but right before it was completed, when nobody was looking, someone had come by and completely destroyed it. Matsuda said that this reduced Junko to tears and that he looked everywhere for the culprit, but with no luck. While Matsuda stared over the wreckage of Junko's sandcastle in defeat, Junko came up behind him and revealed that she was the one who destroyed it. The reason as to why she did this is highly speculated, and I've seen some claim that the reason for this was to drive herself into despair even more since she has such an uncanny obsession with it, but on the wikia page it claims that she did this to get Matsuda out of the house since he'd been acting withdrawn since his mother's death. As a teenager, she began a modeling career and became very popular among the Japanese population for not being fake. Jinko seemed to have very little to no fulfillment from her fans, claiming that the only men interested in her were all creeps 
who didn't actually care for her. Her modeling career grew to be so successful that she was scouted out and accepted by Hope's Peak Academy as the ultimate fashionista. This is where she began to unfold her plan of creating the worst, most despair-inducing incident in the history of mankind. She began by creating the tragedy of Hope's Peak Academy, which was where she forced the student council members and the ultimate hope, Izuru Kamakura, into the first mutual killing where the only survivors were Izuru and Soshun Murasame. But Soshun was later killed by Matsuda as a way to help cover up Jinko's plans. The events of this first mutual killing was broadcasted to the reserve corps students who were paying high prices to attend the academy. After watching this, they felt as if their payments to the academy were being used to create murderers, specifically Izuru, since that was where a majority of the school's funding was going towards. This caused them to begin rioting, which eventually led to a movement outside of the walls where the poor protested against the wealthy and the talented, and this movement was what eventually led to the biggest, most awful, most tragic event in human history. Or, the tragedy. When Jugo began setting up plans for the mutual killing in Danganronpa 1, she decided to test out memory erasing procedures with the help of her childhood friend and lover, Yasuke Matsuda, the ultimate neurologist. By testing this out, Junko became Ryoko Otanashi and created a fake diary of memories to convince herself that she was an entirely different person. Matsuda reluctantly helped her with this plan with his own intentions in mind. He reveals at the end of Danganronpa Zero that he both loves and hates Junko and wants to protect her no matter what the cost, but also wants to protect the world from her. This is why he decided that he would continually erase her memories and plant new fake memories into her notebook so that she wouldn't remember anything at all and stay Ryoko Otanashi forever. While this was going on, Makuro Ikusaba took on the persona of Junko and killed the school board committee members. This was under Junko's direct orders that she had given out before losing her memories. Eventually, Junko regains her memories once again and reveals that the memory erasing plan was for two different reasons. The first was to test it out so she could use it on the participants in Danganronpa 1's killing game, but also so she could feel the ultimate despair of killing the one person that was most important to her. Yasu Matsuda. Fairly soon after this, the Reserve Corps students all committed mass suicide on Junko's request. This furthered the message of despair even greater. The social unrest around the academy began as an online debate that eventually grew to riots outside of the school. They eventually became about more than just the school itself, but about the wealthy versus the poor, and grew increasingly more violent and destructive, and led to more people falling into despair and eventually wars. The wars are described as only happening for the sake of war and destruction, which means that there was no way they could be resolved. This again was the event known as as the tragedy. Around the time the tragedy began, Junko stopped five abused children from Hope's Peak Academy's elementary school from committing suicide. These kids were of course Nagisa, Kodoko, Jatoro, Masaru, and Monika. Junko stopped them from giving their lives away by asking them to give their lives to her instead. But, of course, Junko was only truly interested in Monika because of her connections to the Toa group, which would give her the ability to mass produce the dangerous robot Monokuma killing machines. The ultimate despairs began spreading despair everywhere they turned while the Warriors of Hope began to create a paradise for kids by killing all adults. The 78th class of Hope's Peak Academy lived peacefully for a year inside the lock school until Junko found a way to incapacitate them and erase their memories. She then executed Jin Kirigiri, the principal, and began a mutual killing in Danganronpa 1. After she was executed in the final chapter of Danganronpa 1, it's revealed that she created an AI of herself as backup that she implanted into Monokuma. We see this in the bonus scene at the end of Danganronpa 1. This AI is used in both another episode inside of Shirakuma and Kurokuma, who both manipulate the actions of the children and the adults to influence the most despair-inducing outcome. Both robots are destroyed in the end and collected by Izuru Kamakura, who downloads her AI into the Neo World program where we see her in Super Danganronpa 2. And at the end of that game, she reveals that her plan was to download her AI into the comatose bodies of the Super Danganronpa 2 cast and eventually create Jinko Land, where the world would be filled with copies of herself. This concludes the summary portion of this analysis, and going from here, I would like to begin breaking down her character. It's implied several times throughout the series that Jinko is a holder of many talents and is quite intelligent. These instances can be seen when she uses the inspiration from Fujisaki's AI to create her own, when she recreates an almost perfect intricate design of the Sagrada Familia at a very young age out of sand, and her ability to understand thousands of people and use their weaknesses to manipulate them, and by the classification she received as the ultimate analysis 
Colossus when she was disguised as Ryoko Otanashi. So I think it's safe to say that Jinko was born into the world with a great amount of talent and knowledge, and that this gave her a superiority complex above anyone else she met, even those she loved. Jinko probably views herself as godlike in a way. She's able to control and manipulate practically everyone she meets. She was even able to learn things like advanced computer programming in the span of a few weeks, and this made her feel as if she knows everything about anything and everybody, including herself, and it bores the absolute shit out of her. She reached the point where she feels that she's so powerful that she's become bored with everything and everyone, including herself. And this is what led her to create multiple personalities of herself, several being characterized by human emotions including depression or rage. I think the reason she began creating these personalities and why she loves despair so much is because she was so tired of feeling extreme boredom and indifference in her life. The reason for her obsession with despair as an emotion could be linked to the fact that despair is an all-consuming emotion that can easily drive a person into the brink of insanity. It's a feeling that can follow you anywhere and consume all of your thoughts and actions completely if you allow it to. Whereas a more joyful emotion such as hope or love you have to actively maintain in order to feel it all the time. Despair, on the other hand, you only have to passively accept for it to consume you entirely. Jinko's entirely let it consume her being. She even states that it's a part of her characterization and who she is. But I'll talk a little bit more why I believe she has such an obsession with despair in a little bit. The odd thing about Jinko is that although she claims that her characterization is completely defined by despair, it's not as if we don't see her feel positive emotions such as hope or love, and it doesn't necessarily seem that she hates these feelings either. This can especially be seen in Danganronpa Zero where she states that she was in love with Matsuda to the point of insanity, where all she wanted to do was be in his embrace and his presence. This implies that she hoped to always be with him and love him, but she finds the excitement of the despair she would experience from murdering him in cold blood, and by bluffing that she was the reason for his mother's illness before he died, better. She also acts as if she's incredibly narcissistic, and that she loves herself above all else. And although it's true that all of her actions are self-serving in the terms that they all contribute to the sake of despair, she contradicts her love for herself after killing Matsuda by saying that she felt an incredible amount of self-loathing, even though it's obvious she loves the feeling of despair. Not only this, but after Matsuda breathed his last breath, she stomped on his body, tears streaming down her face, until he was a completely unrecognizable mess. Why would she do this even though it's obviously causing her an intense amount of pain? I think this could be because she feels inhuman-like with the amount of talent and intelligence she holds. She states that she feels as if her whole existence was a mistake from the moment she was born. This implies to me that she believes she doesn't belong in this world because of how superior she thinks she is. That she feels inhuman. Despair is an emotion that we all feel at one point in our life. And whether or not we let it consume us, it is a very real human emotion and probably one of the strongest emotions one could ever feel. I think that Jinko forces herself to do these deeds to make herself feel human. I think she longs to feel this way and that her greatest fear is living in a perpetual state of boredom and indifference. As to why she doesn't let positive emotions like love or hope help convince her of her humanness is another story. I think that this goes back to the fact that positive emotions you have to actively seek in order to maintain them, and Jinko prefers to lie in despair rather than actively put effort into relationships with others. And I think this can be traced to the fact that she may not believe anyone including the one she loves is worth her effort since she thinks so highly of herself. Overall, Jinko is a very intricate character with one absolute goal to bring despair. Whether or not it be to herself or others around her, every action she makes is contributed to that goal, which is exactly what Kadaka intended. As for some sort of like trivia and fun facts about Jinko's character, there wasn't a whole lot that I found, but I did see a couple of cool things on the wikia page, and the first one is that Jinko's English title is Ultimate Fashionista, but in the Japanese version, it's more of the Ultimate Gayaru, and Gayaru means a uh, gal. And basically, um, she is this Gayaru or Kogayaru, which is a high school Gayaru, basically. And um, it is a subtitle of basically being a Gayaru or a gal. And um, the thing that's interesting about this is that she represents a lot of different um, characteristics that these sorts of people have. And some different sort of examples of this is that um, she shortens her skirt of her school uniform and she has a fondness of platform boots. And we see both of those. Another quality that these Gayarus have is that they extensively decorate their cell phones which AI Jinko in the second game when she is an avatar 
is highly decked out extensively with different like trinkets and stuff. And so these are all things that basically are tributes to this type of ultimate talent that she has. And one thing that's not explicitly stated in the game, but is in a tribute of a Gaiaru, is um, bleaching someone's hair or um, wearing colored contact lenses. And when we see um, Junko as Ryoko Otanashi, she has red hair and red eyes. So it's sort of implied through this that that is her original hair and eye color and that once she became the sort of Gaiaru, she uh, bleached her hair and got colored contacts. One of Junko's poses is actually a reference to Dio Brando from JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. She also says his catchphrase, useless, 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 during a machine gun talk battle. But with that, it concludes my character analysis and summary of Junko. I hope you guys enjoyed. I did want to mention a couple of things. So a few of you guys have come to me just recently and mentioned different fan games or stories they're working on. And it seems like a lot of you guys in the comment section were pretty interested. So just wanted to try and like spread the word about a few of those. The first is an action fighting game using the Danganronpa characters by Trey Pinland and he's actually holding uh, voice auditions right now for it and he sent me a couple of just like different drawings and stuff for the game and I think it's a pretty cool idea so if you guys want to audition for that I'll put the link in the description. And then Nate Zawadzki mentioned in my last video that he was working on another sort of type of Danganronpa fan game with completely original characters and stuff like that so I'll post a link in the description if you want to look up some of his original characters and story ideas. They're pretty cool from what I've seen so far. But if you guys want to check those out I think they're pretty cool and I'm not completely sure what my next video will be. Probably a countdown or another character analysis and you guys have sent me a ton of different requests for character analysis videos. It's awesome. I think the next one I'm gonna end up doing is Gundam but after that possibly Hajime, I've seen a lot of uh, recommendations for Akane, uh, Salise, and um, Ibuki, and Fukawa, so it's sort of around those few characters that I'm thinking of doing after Gundam, but I'm not completely sure. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I will see you real soon. Subscribe to Weeby News for more hope-filled videos.